basic and the most used conditional statement in programming uh, in the next section. Additionally, guys, we're going to have to start looking at the more complex data types that are available for us to use. Uh, arrays are really powerful, really popular in the world, and really easy to use once you've got yourself set up with them. Arrays, of course, also exist in JavaScript. So we're going to have a look at arrays in the context of JavaScript and how it can make uh, repeatedly executing the same statement much easier than it would otherwise be. Finally, guys, we're going to look at loops, and loops are the actual command in order to repeatedly execute the same statement for whatever number of times that you wish. We'll be looking at two basic loops in this class. We'll be looking at the for loop, and then we'll also be looking at the while loop. And you'll see exactly why we're actually going to build out uh, an actual good-looking HTML page using a loop at the end of the class. But before we do that, guys, we're going to need to learn all of the sections in this class in the context of what we know so far from JavaScript. Okay, so we're going to get started, guys, and we're going to go straight into our first topic of the day. But before that, guys, I have a question for you, and I think you guys will find this quite interesting. So conditional logic is basically like a logical process, except that a computer executes that conditional logic. Uh, humans naturally have their own logical skills. However, humans actually have an innate a uh, mistake in our natural ability to make logical uh, reasoning. So there are two kinds of reasoning, guys. There's deductive reasoning and there's inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is strictly correct logic, whereas inductive reasoning is not strictly correct logic, but it is a very powerful tool that humans have used throughout our entire existence in order to make leaps of faith and to save ourselves from dying. It's a very powerful natural evolutionary tool However, it doesn't apply when we're looking at computers. I'm going to ask you guys a question now. It's a little bit of a riddle, and I'd like you guys to have a think about it. We'll come back to it at the end, and we'll give you the answer. But for now, guys, I'm just going to pose to you the question, and we'll see what you guys can come up with. So here is a statement that I'm going to give you. If a card has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. This statement, guys, you can take it to be absolutely true. If a card is one vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. This is the premise of the argument that I'm making. So these are the four cards that I'd like you to have a look at. We've got A, K, 2, and 7. It could be part of a deck card. It could really be anything, guys. But what I'm asking you guys is if these cards uh, conform to the rules and which cards you have to turn over or cards must be turned over in order to determine that these four cards are following the above rules. So I want you guys to let me know which cards you have to turn over in order to ensure that that rule has been followed, the if a card is about on one side rule. I will come back to this and I'll explain the answer and I'll also explain exactly why that answer is correct and the other answers are not. So don't forget guys, these are four separate cards and each of them has something on the back of them. Which cards do I have to turn over in order to ensure that the above rule has been followed? Okay, we're going to move on with the class for now, but I hope you guys are interested in seeing the answer to this at the end of the class. Okay, so our first topic of the day, guys, is conditional logic. So to start things off, let's talk about the English first. A uh, conditional statement. This is a more general rule, not specific to programming. A conditional statement, it's an if-then statement in which a hypothesis is followed by a conclusion. So the hypothesis is the, you know, the, the if, and then the conclusion is, well, the then part of that statement. In programming, this is managed by, well, you would have guessed it, probably the if statement. This is the most common and one of the most powerful statements that exist in programming languages in general, not only JavaScript. It's found in just about every piece of software that's made out there in the world, no matter what language it's created in. Of course, guys, that extends to web applications. So if you see a web application out there in the world, you can basically guarantee that the if statement is in the code somewhere. And as I've mentioned, guys, it is the simplest and most popular method to create a conditional statement in programming. So having a quick look at the image on the right-hand side, guys. You can see 
we've got the tick mark, and we've got the X box. So it's essentially like a set of rules to follow. So if true, go upwards. If true, go upwards. If true, go upwards. And if false, you go downwards. And this is like an if tree. You can describe it as a tree. So you can make a lot of if statements. You can make a lot of things to happen when very specific conditions are met because you can get the tick or the X to be determined by any number of factors. All right. So the if statement, guys, essentially means, guys, that we'll be executing code based on whether or not a condition is met. This condition, guys, could be anything. It could be uh, the result of a calculation being correct, uh, if a button is pressed, uh, if a password is wrong, and so on. And, of course, in programming, that means that there is a Boolean data type at the end of it that lets us know if something happened, the true data type, uh, the true Boolean, or if something didn't happen, which is the false Boolean data type. So in simple terms, guys, the if statement checks if a condition is met, so if a Boolean result is true, and if it's met, some code is executed. Uh, of course, the important note is that the condition is a Boolean value, and a Boolean value doesn't necessarily just exist as a variable. It can be just a temporary Boolean. It can be a function return, which we'll speak about at a later date. And basically, that means, guys, that you can be very sure whether this if statement should run or not, if you know what the condition is. So have a look at an if statement, guys. We have the if keyword at the very beginning. So this is the JavaScript keyword to state that you want to create an if statement. After the if statement, you have opening and closing circular brackets, and then opening and closing curly brackets, much like a function looks like inside JavaScript, except that we don't have to name it because the if itself is the name of the statement. Between the circular brackets, we then input our condition. Now, this condition can be essentially anything that eventually returns a Boolean value. And we'll show you a practical example again in a few moments. If that condition does result to true, guys, what happens, of course, is between the curly brackets, the code, whatever code you want, it could be 90% of your web application, it could be just a quarter of a percent of your web application, it will go inside that if statement. Essentially, it's what you want to happen if that Boolean data type is true. And of course, that is up to you to determine. Okay. So guys, there is another statement that exists in JavaScript called the else statement. And it is a special kind of conditional statement because it must follow an if statement. It can't exist unless there was an if statement directly preceding it. So that means it comes after the if statement. And it ex executes code if the if condition is not met, if the condition of the if statement resolves to false. So it's essentially the polar opposite of what the if statement is. So again, guys, the keyword in JavaScript for the else statement is, of course, the else keyword. And then we have the opening and closing curly brackets, and then all the code that should be executed if that Boolean resolves to false occurs there. Uh, you might notice, guys, that we don't have opening and closing circular brackets before the curly brackets in this else keyword. So basically, guys, the condition for this else loop is the exact same but polar opposite to the condition for the if loop. So essentially, if the if condition resolves to false, the else loop will run. So let me give you guys a practical example now of the if statement because, of course, it's kind of hard to imagine this unless we're actually writing code. So let's go ahead and write code. Uh, guys, I set up a very basic HTML document. It uses a little bit of Bootstrap, which you guys may have seen before or may not. We will be using Bootstrap in a little bit more detail in, um, in Lesson 8 when we put together our web application. But for now, guys, all you need to know is that this style sheet has already been created on our behalf, so we don't have to. So all I need to do, guys, is enter the JavaScript into my script tag, which exists here, and we'll be able to see the results on the screen. So you guys bear with me for just one second while I organize myself so I don't forget anything that I'm trying to uh, that I'm trying to teach you. It would be unfortunate if I missed an important topic. Okay, so let's just start with the bare bones basics. We're going to write out the if statement, and we're going to have our circular brackets, and we're going to have our square, our curly brackets as well. And I'm going to zoom in so you guys can see a little bit more clearly. And you can see, guys, my condition will go between the circular brackets, and then 
any code that I want to write will go into the curly braces. So let's keep things very simple, and instead of using a variable, I'm simply going to use the statement true. As you guys know, true is a special word that is essentially the Boolean value of true. So if true, I can go ahead and say document.write uh, the if statement has executed. So this essentially means that if the condition, which in this case is just the value of true, it'll say the if statement has executed. And that will be nice and simple for us to see. So let's go ahead and run this in Google Chrome and see exactly what happens. So here we go, guys. We got our lesson seven. The results of the JavaScript will appear below. And you can see, guys, that we have the if statement has executed has appeared on the screen. And this essentially means, guys, that that if condition resolved to true and the if statement executed. What happens on the other hand if we go ahead and change this to false? Of course, I'm actually going to go ahead and make it a little bit more complicated this time. And I'm going to ask it to do a comparison. I'm going to say, is 5 greater than 10? Of course, our expected result of this condition would be false. However, let's go ahead and see if the computer agrees with us. I'm going to save this now, guys, and I'm refreshing the page on Google Chrome. And you can see, guys, that this time, that document.write statement never executed. And the reason for this is because the condition of the if statement resolved to false. And as a result, nothing inside the curly braces would run. Nothing inside the curly braces. It doesn't matter if it's one line or if it's 100 lines, nothing inside here would run. Okay, before we move on to some of the more complex conditions that you can use, let's go ahead and talk about the else statement real quick. The else, oops, the else statement should resolve, to, should execute if the condition is false. As we already know, the, the condition is false. So in the ideal scenario, what's happening here is that this document.write function should execute. So I'm going to go ahead and say the else statement. I'm going to make this more grammatically correct by going have executed. Because, of course, guys, you can have 100 statements if you want, not just a single line. So if I now save this, guys, and I refresh the page, you can see that it'll tell us that the else statements have executed, and, of course, that means that the if statements did not. You'll notice, guys, that the way I've organized this is I, if I wrote the if, opening and closing circular brackets, opening and closing curly brackets, and directly after the end of the, of the curly braces for the if condition, I wrote the else keyword. So the JavaScript uh, interpreter will understand that this else statement is directly related to that if statement. Of course, if I now change this back to true, and I'm going to do this in a little bit more of a complicated way, I'm going to create a variable this time and say var my boolean is equal to, and it's going to be equal to a comparison. We're going to go ahead and say, 73 is 73 less than 100. Now, instead of going and writing the Boolean comparison directly into the if statement, I can actually go ahead and just do a comparison on a variable that's been stored on the computer. Of course, I've already created the my Boolean variable, and I've given it a value of whatever that results to. Of course, we expect that to result to true, but we're going to find out in just a moment when I refresh the page. Here we go, you can see guys, this time it says the if statement is executed, which is correct because it means that the condition has resolved to true and it doesn't run any of the statements inside the else condition, inside the else statements, and that is because the if statement condition resolves to true. Uh, somebody raised a very important point to me earlier on uh, it, by email, and that was to tell me that I neglected to mention the case sensitivity of JavaScript and also of HTML. Very important point, guys. Capitalization and lack of capitalization is taken into account by JavaScript. So, for example, if I change my Boolean with a capital B to my Boolean with a small b, it won't have the same answer. In fact, it'll come up with an error in this case if I press F12, which is the troubleshooting menu, which I'll cover at a later date. It'll say my Boolean is not defined because as far as the this browser is concerned, my Boolean with a small b doesn't exist. And that's absolutely correct because we defined our variable, my Boolean, with a capital B. 
be. So bear that in mind, guys. JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and PHP are all case sensitive. So we're going to go ahead and change that back to a capital B now, so that, of course, our code isn't broken. If I refresh that, there we go. We're all fixed up. Um, okay, so let's do something a little bit more complicated than what we've done before. Let's go ahead and change this my Boolean value to a comparison of strings, which you guys have not seen before. Uh, you can also compare strings just like you can compare numbers inside JavaScript. So, for example, you can compare hello and test it to see if it's equal to hello with a small h. These two strings are not considered to be equal to each other as far as JavaScript is concerned. And as a result, of course, that my boolean value has resolved to false. And as a result, it says the else statements have executed because, again, else statements run if the if condition results. All right, brilliant stuff, guys. That kind of covers the basics of the if and else loop. And you'll see a practical uh, example of what we'll be using with that in Lesson 8. But uh, for now, guys, I'm going to go back to the presentation and we're going to move on to the next topic of the day, which is arrays. So arrays are very interesting, guys, and uh, they might seem confusing to you at first, but you'll see very quickly exactly why they exist and why they're such a popular data type to use in JavaScript. Okay, so guys, an array is a special variable in JavaScript. It also exists in a lot of the other programming languages out there. Uh, but it can hold multiple values at the same time. So instead of a variable only holding a single value, it can hold a lot of values as long as they're of the same data type. So it can hold 100,000 strings if you'd like it to. It can hold 100,000 numbers if you'd like it to. That's absolutely fine, but do bear in mind, guys, that they must be of the same data type. So, in JavaScript, to declare an array, we have to use the same rules as before, guys. We're declaring a variable, so we use the var keyword. After that, we name the array to whatever we'd like. In this particular case, it's array name, and then we set it equal to. And here is the difference, guys. In order to declare an array, we use opening and closing square brackets, and then every single element of the array will be put uh, inside the square brackets and then separated by commas. You can have as many elements as you like or as few as you like, uh, and, but they must all go into the square brackets and they can be separated by commas so that the uh, array will know that they are different elements inside it. Okay, so quick example, guys. Why are arrays useful? Well, to look at an example, if you imagine that you're making a web application and it's all about cars, and you need to use the names of these cars inside your code, and then you go ahead, guys, and write three variables just like this. So we've got var car one is equal to a BMW, var car two is equal to a Mercedes, and then var car three is equal to a Ferrari. That's all well and good, guys. But it's not very efficient. Uh, as you can see, these three items, these three variables, are very closely related to each other. They're all cards at the end of the day. So why would we not store them all in a single variable instead? So let's go ahead and use an array this time. And this time, guys, we're going to make a card array, and we're going to set it equal to uh, opening and closing square brackets, BMW as a string, comma separated, Mercedes as a string, comma separated, Ferrari as a string. So now, guys, we have a much more organized system because we now know that the cars array is responsible for all of the strings of the names of cars. You can do this, of course, with numbers, uh, really any kind of value you want. Any kind of data type, guys, can go into arrays. Uh, you can even make uh, an array that stores other arrays, but we won't be getting into that uh, just yet. Okay, so let's go back to our demo of an array, guys, and we're going to go ahead and open up Notepad++ again. For now, I'm going to get rid of these statements because we don't need them for now, and I like to keep things nice and whoops. I need to keep things nice and concise for as long as uh, we're working on one topic at a time. However, I will come back at the end, and what I'll do is I'll use all of the things that we learned in this lesson to create something, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to see the value of these uh, of this information by the end of the class. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and open up my notes just to make sure I don't forget anything. And Okay, so we're good to go. Alright guys, so we're going to go ahead and create an array now. So to do this, of course, as I mentioned, you need to use 
the var keyword to say, I want to declare and store a variable somewhere. And of course, the somewhere is whatever the name is. So in my case, guys, I'd like to make an array of animals. So let's make an array of animals. To do this, I need to use opening and closing square brackets. And then, of course, eventually I'll want to end my statement with a semicolon. So guys, I would like to ask you, uh, what would you like to go into this animals array. So can I get just like four or five animals to go inside this array and I'll go ahead and well, lots of, lots of people coming in. All right, so the first one in is from Deminder saying cat. So let's go ahead and say cat. Uh, there are a lot of answers coming in guys, so I am very much picking randomly from the box. We got spiders from Nathan, all right. So let's go ahead and type spiders in here. Uh, comma separated, uh, platypus. Do you know what's really strange guys? Is that every time I teach this class, someone for some reason says platypus. They love platypuses. I actually started to like platypuses as well. Uh, we got giraffe at from depth array. Let's go ahead and add a giraffe in here. Um, giraffe. Uh, we got uh, elephant as well. Let's go ahead and type in elephant. Um, we've got uh, whelk from uh, Mike, I think. Whelk. Okay, I'm actually not sure what kind of animal a whelk is. Uh, so let's go ahead and go whelk. Okay, one final one, guys. What is a platypus? It's a very unusual sea animal, as far as I'm aware. Uh, the last one from Zakaria saying carrot. So let's go ahead and type in carrot here. All right, guys. Uh, also, spiders are uh, more of a species of insect or something like that. But never mind. That's okay. All right, so guys, we've now got an array of animals. We've got a bunch of animals, and they're all stored nice and neatly inside this variable known as animal. That's all great. That's brilliant. But how do we actually access and change and store all of this information uh, or make changes or display them or do whatever we like with them? Well, guys, to access an array, uh, we need to do something a little bit different to what we've done before. So again, guys, I'm going to use the document.write function just to display information for you guys so you can see the results. Uh, to access the animals array, uh, it's in the same way as other uh, uh, other variables. So we go animal. Uh, but this time, guys, because this animal contains a lot of information in an organized manner, we instead need to access an element of this animal's array. To do that, we go opening and closing square brackets, just like before. Now, here's where it gets a little bit confusing. Uh, for those of you guys new to programming, the first element in this array is not in position one it's actually in position zero. Because in all programming, everything starts from zero. So if you want to access the first element of an array, guys, you need to type in zero. So if I go ahead and save this and refresh the page, you'll see that cat gets printed out to the screen. And that's exactly what we were expecting. However, if we go animals one, we're not accessing the cat position, we're accessing the spider's position. So again, if I save this and refresh the page, you'll get spiders instead. Now this might be confusing for those of you guys who might be asking why. Uh, the reason is because in all programming at the more lower level in terms of building a computer and how computers work inside their heads, uh, everything starts from zero. So it's a bit of a weird one, guys, but you'll get used to it very quickly and you can be reasonably sure that no matter what programming language you're in, arrays will always start from position zero and go to their final position, which is the last element in the array. How do I find the array length? That's a great question because we're going to do that right now. So uh, bear with me, guys, while I, while I get to that. Um, arrays and, uh, in fact, all kinds of data types that we've covered so far, you can actually find out how long they are. You can do it to strings. And you can also do it to arrays. And to do it, guys, for any given data type, well, we simply need to name the, the, the data type. So in our case, whoops, we're trying to access the animal data. Uh, and we're just going to call a method on it. So we're going to go dot, because we're calling a function that's already inbuilt into this animal data type. And we're going to ask it for its length. So we're going to say dot length. And it'll tell us exactly how long it is. So if we save this, guys, and we're we refresh the page, you'll see that the answer is seven. And of course, if we count up, go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there are seven elements in the array. Note, guys, that if I went ahead and said animals, and I tried to access the seventh element in the array, that is non-existent because the last element is still position six. However, if you ask it for its length, it will give you the number of elements in the array. We can now instead 
instead of accessing the animal array, we can access the animal element. So we can go animal zero, and let's ask this string for its length instead of asking the whole array. So we're instead of asking the entire array for its length, we're just going to ask the cat string for its length. So if I save this, guys, and refresh the page, you'll get an answer of three because cat has three characters in it. It's got the C, it's got the A, and it's got the T. So that's how you can find out the length of a string. Okay, so uh, let's just make sure that I've got everything uh, going on here. Make sure everything's all right. Uh, yeah, looks like we're good to go, guys. And these arrays, I'm actually going to leave the animals array there. I'm just going to remove the document that right. We're going to go back to the presentation now and learn our final topic of the day. And then you will see exactly how powerful an array and a loop working together can be. So what exactly is a loop? Well, a loop in programming, guys, is a programming construct and it allows one or more statements to be repeatedly executed a desired number of times. So essentially what's happening is that the logic of those statements can be the exact same and all that the loop does is it says, run this loop however many times you have told it to run. There are a couple of loops that we're going to be looking at today, but we're going to be focusing on one of them in particular, and we'll see an example of the other loop at a later date. So guys, the for loop is the first most common and very, very powerful loops in existence in JavaScript, and again, guys, in a lot of other programming languages. So the for loop, it executes a block of code a certain number of times. In a JavaScript, this is what a for loop looks like. We've got our for keyword, and there we go, guys. Here's another keyword for you guys inside JavaScript. So for is the keyword to let the browser or the interpreter know that you're trying to create a for loop. And here's where it gets a little bit complicated because you can see we've got opening and closing circular brackets and opening and closing curly braces. But until now, you've only ever seen a single thing going into the circular bracket. But this time, we've got three things. We've got statement one, we've got statement two, and we've got statement three. So a for loop has a special construction. It's got three statements inside of it. It's got statement one, two, and three, and they serve very specific functions, guys. If I go back to statement one real quick, statement one is the initial condition. It's the first thing that happens before the for loop ever runs. So this is how you can set up how long you want to run the for loop for. Statement two is the actual condition for the for loop to keep going. So if statement two resolves the true, the Boolean data type once again, it will execute the code inside the curly braces. Finally, statement three is the thing that changes every time the for loop runs. And this is how we can eventually get from the initial condition statement one to a situation where statement two resolves to false and the for loop will end. Now, of course, that sounds really complicated and strange, so let me give you a practical example inside the presentation before we go back and we'll do it in practice in Notepad++. So this is a more realistic situation. Uh, we've got our for loop, except this time we've got actual values inside our for loop. So let's have a quick look, guys. We've got this i value, and this i value is just a number variable that exists that we can use, and we're going to set the initial value for this i number data type to be equal to zero. So this is the starting point, and the reason it's zero is, by default, is the same reason as the position of an array starts at zero. Zero is the logical starting point in computer programming. So this is the first time the for loop is checked. So we're going to set i equal to zero. That's perfect. And then we're going to check to see if the for loop should run. It's going to check to see if i is less than the number five. Of course, zero in this instance is less than the number five. So it says, okie dokie, let's go ahead and get started. At this point, guys, it actually executes whatever code you have inside your for loop. So whatever that may be, whatever process you want to do, whatever writing out to the document that you'd like to do, that goes ahead and happens after the, the conditional check. That's perfect, and that's wonderful. Once the code has been executed, it runs statement three. In this case, it goes I++. And for those of you guys out there who haven't seen this before, I++ 
is essentially a shortcut to say i is equal to i plus 1. So basically, it just adds 1 to the value of i. So i plus plus is saying, I would like to add the number 1 to whatever the value of i currently is. So in this case, i changes to the number 1 from the number 0, and then we start again, guys. This time, the initial condition is not to reset the value to 0. Instead, i is now equal to 1. Again, it'll check to see, is 1 less than 5? The answer, of course, is yes, absolutely. And it'll just keep going like this, guys. And then eventually, of course, i will be equal to 5, and 5 is not less than 5, and then therefore the for loop will finally end. This is the standard construction for a for loop, guys, and you'll see it appearing everywhere inside uh, JavaScript. I want to have a quick look now, guys, at the while loop before we go back to the notepad plus plus. The while loop is both more simple and more complicated. In terms of building a while loop, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot simpler to build. However, using the while loop is more complicated. So I'm not going to get into too much detail about the while loop until we get to lesson eight when we have a good reason to use it. But to give you guys a quick look at what the while loop does, we need to use the while uh, JavaScript keyword as always. Uh, while is the keyword for declaring a while loop. The condition that goes between the circular brackets is simply the same as statement two of a for loop. It simply checks, and if the condition resolves true, it runs the while loop. Otherwise, it stops running the while loop. And the reason I say it's more complicated to use is because it's much easier with a while loop to get into situations where you break your code. And that is why I'm going to leave it alone until we get to lesson eight. All right, guys, let's go ahead and do our loop demo now. We're going to go ahead and open up the path Again, as I said, I'm actually going to leave that animals array there because we will be using it in a few moments. But for now, let's go ahead and create our for loop for the first time. So again, to declare a for loop, we simply need to use the for JavaScript keyword. After that, we've got opening and closing circular brackets and opening and closing uh, curly brackets as always. The difference, of course, is this time our conditions are a little bit more complicated than what we've seen before. But let's go ahead and, for now, simply imitate what we had inside our presentation. Okay, so I've got i is equal to zero, i is less than five, i plus plus. And then we have our conditions to be executed inside here. So this is the exact same construction as what we had in the presentation just a few moments ago. For now, I'm going to keep things simple, and I'm just going to document that right. Uh, I'm going to use some HTML formatting here just so that things look a little bit neater. I'm going to say opening paragraph tag the for loop as executed. And then I'm going to end my paragraph. If I save this, guys, and then I refresh Google Chrome, you'll see that it says the for loop is executed, but it's actually executed five times because it went i is equal to zero, that's one, i is equal to one, that's two, i is equal to two, that's three, i is equal to three, that's four, and then i is equal to four, that's five, i is equal to five, and then it'll stop running the loop. So note, guys, that it goes from zero to four. The value of i goes zero, one, two, three, four, and then at five, it stops running the loop, and it resets again. To give you guys an actual demonstration of why this would be useful, uh, we're actually going to start using the value i inside the for loop, because that i is actually a variable. And you'll notice that it's changing just a little bit every time we run the for loop. So let's go ahead and say the for loop is executed. That's perfect. We're going to keep that line there, and we're going to say this is v, and then we're going to do a little bit of string concatenation. And to do string concatenation, guys, in JavaScript, we use the plus symbol. Plus just simply adds two strings together and joins them. And it's a very good way to, ch to add a string that we've just declared like this to a string that's actually part of a variable. So we're going to go, this is the i, and then we're going to say, run of the loop. So this will actually tell us which run we're in when we use this particular document that I write. It's going to tell us what the value of i is every time we run the loop. If we save this, and we go back to Google Chrome, and refresh the page, you'll see the for loop is executed. This is the zero run of the loop. This is the one run of the loop. This is the two run of the loop. This is the three run of the loop. And this is 
positive. You'll notice, of course, my grammar is not particularly good in that situation, but uh, that is something we'll worry about at a later date. How do we make it increment by two or three? Uh, you can go ahead and do that if you'd like. Um, let's go ahead and quickly demonstrate this. Instead of going I plus plus, we can go I is equal to I plus two, or I is equal to I plus three, or I is equal to I multiplied by 865. You can do anything you like, guys, in statement three. Uh, the most common thing is just to add one to your incrementer. Uh, it's the most common use, but there are situations where you'd want to use um, uh, another way of changing the format. All right, guys, so uh, it's still hard to understand for some of you guys uh, who haven't seen this before exactly what the point of all this is. Well, now, guys, let's go ahead and add this array that we built before to this board. We're actually going to use the animals array now. Uh, this will be hopefully interesting for you guys. This time, I'm going to write this document.write function again. So just to do some HTML formatting with our string concatenation once again, we're going to go ahead and say the element in the animal array is. And then we're going to concatenate the animal element. And then we're going to end our statement with a closing paragraph. So inside this, between the two pluses here, what I'm going to do is type in animal. And instead of giving it a fixed value inside our uh, selector between the square brackets, I'm actually going to put the value of i in here. And in this way, guys, what happens is every time the forward runs, we're accessing a different element in the animals array. So let's go ahead and save this. And we're going to refresh the page, and you'll see, guys, that suddenly we're able to access every single element inside this array up to the value of 5, which is uh, what I wrote inside the for loop. So you get the element in the animals array is cats, spiders, platypus, giraffes, and elephants in the correct order, of course, as well. So you can see, guys, how you can very quickly start to build very interesting content just by using this logic. I'm not quite finished there, though. Of course, we've got i's less than 5 here. That seems a little bit silly because it means that our array always has to be of size 5, or else it'll just cut the animal's array short. Uh, of course, we can do something more complicated in all the statements inside this order. For example, I'm going to go i is less than animal length. So this time, what's happening is I'm actually checking the length of the animal's array, and I'm going to use the for loop that many times. So if I ever want to add to the animal's array, it will actually increase the number of times I run the for loop as well. So if I refresh the page, you can see it's already filled up through the entire set of array. But now let's go ahead and add a couple more elements to this array. Guys. We're going to go ahead and I'm going to see um, uh, we've got peacock, on space, uh, zebra. So I've added two elements to this array now, guys. If I now save this, you'll notice that my programming has automatically allowed the for loop to run an extra two times because it automatically knows that it needs to because we're using the length of the array. And you can see, guys, you can magically create very interesting content very, very quickly. You can see, guys, that you can build some very interesting content dynamically using JavaScript. But I do want to give you guys a quick example of how, how much you can actually add to this, uh, how much further you can actually bring this. And in this case, guys, I'm just going to copy-paste this because uh, it's a little too much code to write from scratch. But you can see, guys, that I've done the exact same thing. This time, I've used two elements. Two, array, two arrays, so I've got my cards array, and then I've got information about the cards as well. And I've got four i's equal to zero, i is less than three, i plus plus, everything that you've seen before, except this time my document.write is a lot more complicated. I quickly want to open up what that HTML actually looks like. So let me just go ahead and see what the actual HTML looks like. This guy is what HTML would look like if you're building your website using Bootstrap. But not only that, I'm also including the card i. I'm also including the card info i. So what I'm doing is I'm adding those two array elements to the contents of this HTML. Uh, if I save this now, guys, if I save this index.html file, I just want to make sure that, yeah, it looks like it's been formatted correctly. And I refresh the page. You'll see very quickly, guys, that we can build dynamic content that looks nice with 
static HTML and a little bit of dynamic HTML. So we've created three thumbnails here, and they all look like they're completely different contexts, but they're all based on the same HTML uh, and the same JavaScript, just repeating that code a few times. Uh, we will actually be doing this again in Lesson 8, but in more detail, we'll be using a database and lots of very interesting things. But for now, guys, you can have some idea of how you can dynamically generate content using a programming language. Of course, I will be linking this code to you guys in the resources section of the student area, as always. We are a little bit late. Ah, we're just about right, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to finish up the class now. But for now, before we finish things up, I'd like to go back to our conditional logic question. Just to repeat the question to those of you guys who missed the start, uh, if a card has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. So this is our premise. This is something that we want to show uh, that these four cards are not breaking that rule. Which card do we have to turn over to ensure that, that rule has been followed without uh, uh, an exactly just the number of cards, no more and no less? Uh, all right, so let me just go ahead and first of all, I'm going to give you guys the answer, and then I will explain why the answer is. So for those of you guys who said A and 7, congratulations, you are correct. But guys, if you didn't get it, don't worry. I also got this wrong the first time I saw this, so um, you're not alone in that regard. Okay, so now I'm going to explain exactly why. Uh, a lot of you guys definitely caught on that A has to be turned over. And of course, that's correct. Because the statement says, if a card is a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. So we have to turn over A to make sure that there is an even number on the other side, to make sure that the rule is being followed for A. A is, of course, a vowel. And we need to make sure that there's a number on the other side so that the rule is being followed. Now, some of you guys guessed K, that K has to be turned over. And that is inductive reasoning, because if a card has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. At no point does it actually tell you that if a card has a consonant on one side, it must have an odd number or an even number on the other side. So K does not have to be turned over. In fact, K could have a picture of a smiley face on the other side, and the rule won't be broken. <laughs> so K has nothing to do with the rule that we're trying to prove. So K doesn't have to be turned over, but it's completely understandable if you thought it did. Now, 2 also does not have to be turned over. And this is a slightly more subtle reason. It says, if a card is a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. It does not say that a card, if a card has an even number on one side, it has to have a vowel on the other side. So that is like inverted reasoning. Uh, two could also have a smiley face on the other side, and it still wouldn't be breaking that original rule. Now the last one, the number seven, this is quite interesting because it's the hardest one to get. So if you guys only got seven and not the others, uh, fair juice to you, that's very impressive, because uh, 7 is a very strange one. It's still deductive reasoning. We still have to turn it over. And the reason why we have to turn it over is because we have to check the other side to make sure that it's not a vowel. If it's a vowel on the other side, the rule has been broken, because if it's got a vowel on one side and an odd number on the other side, well, then we've broken the rule. So a 7, it has to be checked to make sure that the rule has not been broken. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the riddle. Uh, I certainly did the first time I came across this. Uh, it's very difficult to get your head around if you're new to sort of logical reasoning like this, but it's uh, still a bit of fun anyway. A quick summary, guys. We covered conditional logic, we covered arrays, and we covered loops as well. So now we actually have the tools to build what's known as a control system. It's like the brain encapsulated in a little bit of section. All the little bits of the brain are the if loops, the while loops, the arrays, all of that cool stuff, and that goes inside a control system. Our next lesson, guys, we are finally, finally there. We're introducing PHP. Super important lesson, guys, because we're going to be talking about the back end for the first time, and the back end is really where the heart and soul of web development is. We'll be covering what PHP is. We'll be updating our knowledge of PHP in terms of what we've already learned in JavaScript, both in terms of the basic data types of knowledge and the control systems in PHP as well. So we'll just be looking at the syntax differences and similarities. At the end of the day, guys, the process is the same. Variables are where information is stored. If loops and while loops, they all 